When you're writing or directing, it's very hard to hide who you are because so much of it comes out whether you intend it or not. And when people connect with your work and they see you and they react to you, they're kind of reacting to, to a real honest part of you and they really know aspects of you in an honest way. And so as I have those interactions, it's, it's very, uh, it has a lot of impact on me as well. Hey, I'm Kim and welcome to Vice Talks Film. Today I'm going to be talking with John Favreau, who's the writer and star of Swingers, but also the director of the first two Iron Man films and more recently Chef. And today I'm going to be talking with him about Disney's remake of The Jungle Book. If you can't learn to run with the pack one of these days, you'll be someone's dinner. John, thanks so much for joining me today. My pleasure. You've written several screenplays over the course of your career, but it, you take some time with it. You've spoken a bit about like how you feel like you access creativity and can't really control it. When you're done with a screenplay... That sounds very... Uh, <laughs> it, it sounds very important. What, I, I access it and I can't control yeah, creativity? Yeah, it's more like you access creativity, uh -huh. but you don't really have control over it. I think that's true. Um, I would say it differently. Okay. But, <laughs> but I agree with what you're saying. It's like you, it, it's something, and when inspiration comes to you, or uh, like for writing, I can't just sit down and write. It's like, okay, right. write a screenplay. I wouldn't know it. So when you get hit with a moment of inspiration, I, I really pursue it and chase it. Especially like a movie chef, mm -hmm. I got an idea to, to do it and it hit me, and I, I, it's almost like I'm panicking to write it down before I forget or before I lose the the urge or the inspiration to do it, because I've tried to write and, and, and run out of steam. Yeah. I get to touch people's lives with what I do, and I love it. So I do think that moments of inspiration, especially with the writing, acting is easier, you get a script, you're working with a director, you want to just be a, you know, uh, do what the director wants and, and serve the, the movie. Mm. But when it's starting from scratch, I think that, to, for me, it, I'm not that prolific, so it is a, a bit of a delicate process. Do you ever get the fear, like, oh my God, I can't, I, I may sure. not ever write this in yeah. the screenplay ever Oh, that's yet. how I feel now. Okay, really? I don't yeah. know if another, you know, it only happens every, what, 10 years for yeah. me. So, so developing, coming up with jokes on the set, mm. rewriting, improvising, um, that comes pretty easily to me, but to start with a whole story, whole cloth from nothing, I have tremendous respect for people who could do that, you know, month in, month out. Yeah. It takes a special person who could completely visualize everything. And the few times I've been able to do it, it's really, it is a bit of a, a bit of a, a mysterious process. Well, I like that the idea for Chef came to you while you were meditating, which is just bizarre. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it all, so everything clicked. I was working on something, I wanted to do something about chefs, I wanted to do something about fatherhood, something about divorce, because I'm a kid from a divorced household. And, and there were, all these things were kind of bouncing around. And then, and then they all clicked together. And then once that happened, I started writing down uh, as much of an outline as I could. And I just kept going until, you know, every day just worked on it until I had a, a, a first draft. Little known fact, I found out that you spent some time working on Wall Street yeah, for yeah, about, a year. about a year, yeah. So I was wondering if there were any skills that you learned on the floor there that you... <laughs> no, I wasn't on the floor. I was like a support, I was like an assistant there. Oh, okay. So I wasn't like a trader making, you know, a leaving, uh, it's not like I le left uh, managing a hedge fund to become a, an actor. <laughs> I was probably gonna leave anyway to be, I, w I took the fireman's test in New York. I wanted to be a fireman. Oh. I, didn't, I didn't really have, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I traveled cross country and I, I, I stopped on the way home from California uh, in Chicago and I saw people doing improvisation and I thought that was really cool. And I decided to give that a go. So I, 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 um, I moved there and started studying improvised comedy. And that led to me getting the film Rudy and I moved to LA, I did Swingers. So, you know, it was like a meandering path that led yeah. to where I am now. I wanted to talk a little bit about Swingers. Okay. Um, it's one of my favorite films, okay, namely thank you. because I love the vernacular that you created, yes. and also just the camaraderie between. I love yeah. how much they love each other and yes. want to support each other. Yeah. But I was curious if your friends actually talked like that, or that was that something you. Invented? No, no, it was kind of an exaggeration of it. Okay. Yeah, like Vince would say, "Baby." <laughs> Uh, he wouldn't say your money or stuff, but we did use the word money. Baby, you are so money and you don't even know it. I just exaggerated everything because when I was writing it, 
more because I got some, some uh, screenplay software and I was just writing. I remember I wrote sketches in Chicago in, in the comedy scene, you were constantly writing. Yeah. And so when I got this uh, screenplay software, I just started writing and making characters kind of, uh, to make my friends laugh, like, oh, this is you, and, and just exaggerating whatever qualities there were. But I wasn't really like the guy, uh, Mike, in that movie. He was really depressed and uh, well, what a wet blanket. That what guy. a wet blanket. <laughs> and, and and Vince was, you know, Vince was charming, and of course he brought a lot to the role in his performance. But you know, I, I exaggerated his, um, you know, how hip he was. And then when you perform it, you channel that and and exaggerate and play into it for for comedic purposes. Uh, but then you know, people did start talking more like that afterwards. Going well, I did wonder, and, yeah. 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 You found people just in the street just whipping out the brains. They still do. They still <laughs> yell at you, especially, especially if we're in Vegas, forget it. <laughs> but it's, it's really cool. I, I do like it. And now that I've worked on a lot of stuff, it's interesting to see who recognizes me or knows me from where or what project connects with them. I just, you know, I was just meeting with somebody who said, I'm, they were watching Friends today, and there's episodes where I'm on Friends that's on right now in the reruns. And sometimes Seinfeld comes on. I played a clown in one of the episodes, and people recognize me from that. What are you hassling me for? This is just a gig. It's not my life. Because people don't see it right when they come out. People are just seeing Chef now. People mm -hmm. are discovering other things I've done. Generations are passing down films like Swingers. And so when you meet them, they're looking at you, and they really it feels like they know my heart. And then for them, if they've seen my work, and now they're meeting me, and they like my work, it, it, it's a moment for them, too. So it's just something I, I, I've grown to really appreciate as I, as I you know, get further on in my career. Well, someone called you a bit of a renaissance man to me uh -huh. the other day, and uh, I hear that you were DJing at Mark Ronson's Grammys yeah, party. I, I did all that. Curious about what your choice of songs were for that I, kind of thing. If you like old music, I'm the guy. <laughs> what is that old music? Old, Motown? Old hip-hop, sometimes okay. a little bit of R&B, uh, but, but, but usually old, old hip-hop and, and rock. I like to, you know, I, I met DJ AM uh, on the set of you know on the set of Iron Man 2 and he gave me some pointers back then and as I get to know other people they they'll they'll turn me on I'll turn me on to different music I like the math of it I like I like uh, mixing different beats with different old mix old with the new mm. and um, you know but I'm not up on the current songs <laughs> but I could I could you know I think people get a kick out of that I'm doing it at all yeah sure and certainly at Mark Ronson's Grammy party that was a lot of pressure there were a lot of <laughs> Very uh, people, much more musical than me. Yeah, but but I bet. but everybody was dancing and having a good time. So that was a, that was a real um, memorable moment for me. Now the Jungle Book is deeply loved by many. Did mm -hmm. you have any apprehensions about tackling this project? I, I did because I, I wasn't sure what there was to do with it because I, I, I grew up with the animated film and and I knew Disney was doing live action versions of their animated movies but uh, just going into a jungle and taking a kid and adding digital animals to it felt um, it felt like a hard slog <laughs> and it also felt like difficult circumstances under which to do something creative and and there have been versions of the film like that before uh, but as I spoke to Disney, they were talking about films like Avatar and Life of Pi and, and the idea of actually creating a jungle. I and mean, if you create everything, you can make style choices. You could exaggerate scale. You could change the jungle. You could make it a, a whole a dreamlike experience. And, and walking that line between fantasy and reality and making things that are photoreal and animals that look real but yet move and, and uh, talk like animals but, but can still speak. I wondered if that was possible, and, and that got that piqued my interest, and, and, and so I started thinking about what we could do and how you could reference the older film and even the Kipling books, and, and that's what kind of got me uh, invested in, in the project. Right, because the screenplay is kind of a blend between the Kipling stories and the Disney film, so that yeah. adds a slightly different twist. Yeah, to you couldn't really take the G-rated kids musical and make it live action. I think it would have been odd. But Kipling offered a lot more uh, mythic aspects to it, and the idea of going from a G movie to like a PG adventure film that had thrills and excitement, and something that was more in line with the other older Disney movies, or like Lion King, that was the tone that I was trying to, to blend. Christopher Walken was inspired casting as King Louie. Yeah. Was it intentional that you 
his 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 first shot in the film was a reference to Heart of Darkness and yes. Marlon Brando. Yes, it was, sure. Yeah, it was so like, oh, hang on a minute. There's well, that's Colonel what I think about. There. Well, we changed that whole character because in the in the original, he was you know it was like a musical number and it was an orangutan and it was it was a. Uh, this one we wanted to, because it was a, a, a point of dramatic tension, we wanted to build up on that. And Chris Walken was perfect because, you know, he's, he's menacing but quirky but interesting. And the idea of, because they didn't have orangutans really, they don't have them in India. Even though it was in the Disney movie, it's not in the Kipling. But we wanted to preserve that character. And we came across a species called Gigantopithecus, which really existed uh, tens of thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's ex now extinct. But it was a giant primate that resembled an orangutan, they think. They've only found limited remains. But that allowed us to say, oh, it's like the last remaining of the species living, hidden away. You are a man cub who wants to live in a jungle. How do you know that? Kid, I got ears. My ears got ears. Then that got me thinking about uh, Kurtz and, and Brando in, in Apocalypse Now. And once we decided that, and I talked to Bill Pope, my cinematographer, and then we started designing the lighting uh, in, 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 in the spirit of what Storaro did in that film. So there's a lot of cool references, not just the Disney stuff, but other cinematic references. And I just love his introduction. And then of course, the, you see him come into the light. And then it's designed, you know, based on, on uh, Christopher Walken's uh, facial structure and anatomy. So even though it's, it's this crazy, monster, it still feels like a mask being worn by, by Walken. And with his eyes and all of his performance, we, we really uh, captured the, the data from what he had done in, in the reference. And, and that drove the animation. And so it really looks to me like we really captured part of, you could tell it's Chris Walken when you see him totally. acting. What was it about Bill Murray that said, you know, kind of cheeky, honey obsessed bear? <laughs> uh, you know, Bill Murray's just somebody I've been dreaming of working with my whole career. I moved to Chicago to study improvisation with the same teacher he did. I, I you know, was a fan of Saturday Night Live. That's the, at my age, he was like right in the wheelhouse. Yeah. And there was a movie called Meatballs that was around when I was growing up about a kid who went to camp and, and the cool counselor was Bill Murray. I think it was Bill Murray's first movie. And he just, that's what launched his film career. And as a kid, I remember, oh, that's the coolest big brother you could have. And so the idea of Baloo being a recognizable voice, in the old 67 movie, it was all celebrity casting. So I wanted to have voices you recognized in this film, as with the original. And Bill Murray seemed like the perfect choice, and plus Bill sings, so if he was gonna do Bare Necessities, I, <laughs> I just had a fantasy of him singing. Forget about your worries in the strain. What's that? That's a song about the good life. And being a buddy, but also the type of buddy who's not too sweet, that's giving you a hard time, totally. and kind of a little bit looking after themselves, maybe as much as, as you. And so, you know, that, he was the hardest guy to get involved, because he's, you know, it's not like you call an agent and try to book Bill Murray. He's he's a very elusive figure. Yeah. And so, you know, you you leave messages, you send letters, and eventually, I heard from him. Uh, and uh, before I gave up, and, and and he he said he'd do it. And it's just been been glorious. You send letters, not emails, like hand. I wrote a letter. He has an letter. email, but you don't. I don't. I didn't have his email, but I wrote a letter and gave it to somebody that I knew could get it to him and some artwork. Yeah. And. Um, and, and so uh, to be able to spend time with him. Once he's on board, he's incredibly generous and hardworking, but just to get a hold of him, to get him to commit to a project, he's very, he's very particular. He's not, you know, he, he picks and chooses. So I feel also very honored he, he chose to be in this. I noticed that Sam Raimi was the giant squirrel. Yes. <laughs> Did you have like your friends just calling up and being like, what animal can I be? It was more like, you mind coming in for a day and okay. doing a thing? It's for Disney, it's, a, yeah, it's Jungle Book. And, and Raimi is, um, I know him, you know, as directors, we, we are colleagues and uh, fans of each other's work. Uh, but he also is a really good performer. He's a very funny guy, a lot of personality. What's great about directors is they'll jump in and do a role. They're happy to do it. I remember uh, I did a, a role and so did uh, Rob Reiner and, and Spike Jones on, on Wolf of Wall Street from Martin Scorsese. He's like, right. he says, directors are the best. They take direction. They, <laughs> they're so easy to work with. They, yeah. they love being treated. You know, they love being on somebody else's set. And so I reached out to, to, um, to Sam Raimi. I was like, could you play a squirrel? He's like, a squirrel? Let me see if I, I don't know if I can play a squirrel. But he's, he loves to get laughs. He's, you know, as serious as a filmmaker as he can be, he's also incredibly goofy and fun. I did want to talk about remakes. Okay. Because I'm slightly disturbed by the number of remakes that are coming yeah, out at yeah. the moment. What is happening with Hollywood right now? Why are there so many remakes? 
Well, there's, there always have been, mm. to be honest with you. If you look, you know, we, we're mostly familiar with, you know, just the recent years, but, you know, you go back all the way in history, people were taking plays and remaking it to movies, adapting novels. Um, Ten Commandments was remade by the same filmmaker, you know, in, in silent and in sound. So Hollywood's always looking to pre-existing materials, uh, whether it was in another medium or a film that had been done already. So I think there's something inherent to um, the fact that there are only so many stories and you're looking to, for, uh, for inspiration when, it, when appropriate to go back and, and see if you could uh, get another round out of something that's already tried and true. But I think right now, in particular, it, you're more likely to see a remake or a sequel because the movie business is, is shifting a lot. There's a lot of competition in other media. Certainly my kids' generation is much more comfortable being on a laptop or on an iPad and going from video to video, and they might, they might consume two hours of content, but instead of sitting down for one film or going to a movie theater, they'll just click from, from a 13-minute piece to a five-minute piece to a 13-minute piece. And, and the Internet's very, very adept at guiding you through things that might interest you. Mm -hmm. That's a lot to compete with. And television is just doing a marvelous job, as, as is streaming. And a lot of the more sophisticated stories are going to the small screen because the DVD market kind of went away, and that was what was supporting the more character-based stories. And what are you left with? Either lower-budget films that break through, or comedies that are smaller in budget that break through, or big, expensive, set-piece, tentpole movies that yeah. used to only represent a small fraction of the amount of titles that were out. Now they want, it, they want things that feel a little bit more like a sure bet. And if they're betting as much money as required to do a big spectacle film, they tend to lean back on safer choices that they feel are going to work like genres that have been working, like the superhero films have been working, so you see a lot of those. There's a lot of those. <laughs> a lot of those, and you know, and some great ones, but you know, even the ones, you know, whether they're great or not great, they all seem to be, uh, there seems to be an appetite from the audiences and different tastes for different types of people. So I think that it's really, it's purely fi a financial concern, and as a filmmaker, it's good to understand that that's part of what their, what's part of their calculation that goes into it. And if you could figure out a way to do something that's inspiring and original within that context, I think you're rewarded for it. I think audiences want originality and the studios don't want to take risks on original things. And so if you could mix the safety of what uh, a studio feels comfortable financing with an original take on something, original idea, original technology, piece of casting, uh, that's when I think you break out. I think that there is still room for content that feels original even within those parameters. Thanks so much, John. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure.